uh, Luke for the introduction earlier. So I'm Emma Stone. I'm Director of Evidence Engagement at Good Things Foundation. And it's been a real pleasure and privilege for me to lead on this research collaboration. Um, and I just want to really echo some of what Dave said there about it really has been a collaboration and that's felt very important because this is also about recognising the vital role of libraries as part of a wider ecosystem of support locally and nationally and that includes a lot of um, community organisations, housing associations, local authorities, there are so many people who are really committed and dedicated to wanting to address digital inclusion and that matters because as many of you will be aware there are still one in 20 households with no home internet access. There are at least 2 million adults who are struggling with being able to afford data connectivity and the latest findings from Citizens Advice indicating that maybe a million households have cancelled their broadband contract in the last 6 to 12 months. It just really gives pause for thought on the importance of digital access and what the cost of living crisis um, is now impacting in terms of people's ability to access the internet and skills absolutely essential so we know that there are still 10 million adults who lack the foundation level digital skills which is why this work why digital inclusion is so important and it's why we were really keen to understand uh, what is the role of libraries as part of that wider ecosystem I'd encourage you to have a look at the summary report because you'll be hearing shortly from Lila, who is going to be talking through uh, the findings uh, from the research itself and introducing the framework. But in the summary, Libraries Connected and Good Things Foundation, we came together to think, well, what are we wanting to make as recommendations? What are some of the key takeaways for us? And I just want to highlight three key takeaways. So one is pressure. The pressure on library services, the pressure on staff and volunteers, the pressure on community organisations, including for ongoing demand to be that front line of council services in some cases. So the request for help with form filling, for example, um, as well as uh, helping to get people online and learn how to use the Internet. So pressure is the first one. The second one is partnerships. It was really, really striking how many branches and how many services are working in partnership with other community organisations in their area, but also regional and national partnerships as well. And the third is potential. And one of the things that I'm so glad we did through the survey was ask not only what people already provide, but what they're developing and what they're wanting to develop. And it was really clear from that, that there is a very strong appetite amongst libraries across the country for wanting to evolve and develop their offer. Um, and, and that's a cue for me to say, libraries connected, Good Things Foundation, we are absolutely here to support you to do that. We want to help you to develop your offer around data connectivity, around uh, providing people with access to devices and around supporting people to learn how to use the Internet. Um, many of you are doing absolutely brilliant things already, but if there are ways in which you want to evolve and develop your offer, we hope the framework report and also the resources, the free resources we have available will help you to do that. But one of the things we also want to do is we also want to advocate and we want to speak into government and there are recommendations here for government to say we need a refresh for England of the digital inclusion strategy. The last one was in 2014 and we need that refresh to recognise and resource the role of libraries and community organisations and others in providing that digital inclusion support. There are recommendations too for those of you who in the room are from local authorities and those of you who are responsible for library services as well in terms of encouraging you to reflect on and think about your offer, how to evolve that and your partnerships. And we've also pointed the finger back at us. So there are recommendations there for Libraries Connected and Good Things Foundation too. So I'm going to stop there uh, to hand over uh, to Lila, who is going to be able to talk more fully about what um, the main findings were from the research itself. Um, and it'll be my pleasure to come back um, at the end uh, of today's launch event uh, to say a number of thank yous um, and to make a few final remarks. But over to you, Lila. Thank you, Emma. And uh, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. It's really um, a pleasure to be here and to be have the chance to 
share back with you the results of what, as Emma has said, and absolutely is the case, was a real, um, really collaborative um, piece of research that we've carried out with Libraries Connected, Good Things Foundation, and also the forums and library services that are involved uh, with all of you. Um, so Emma's given some great background. I don't have a kind of three Ps um, thing to share with you, but I'll um, see if I can think up one by the end. Um, but what I am going to do is briefly cover what we were asked to do, how we approached that, and then take you through some of the findings um, and before finishing with um, a few remarks that maybe um, speak to that advocacy point that Emma made um, just at the end now. Um, the next slide, please, Lou. Thanks. Um, so what Libraries Connected and Good Things said they wanted to understand was um, they really wanted to understand the spectrum of digital inclusion approaches being used by library services and library branches in England, and then build a more sophisticated understanding about those approaches, not only among policymakers, but also other audiences that you may um, want to influence. And we did three main things. Uh, we developed um, in a very collaborative way, a framework um, of five areas of, um, of libraries work on um, digital inclusion. Um, we developed a set of practice notes that go into a lot more depth about each of those areas. Um, and we carried out a survey across all library services to, um, to understand uh, what that looked like um, across your whole um, membership. Um, and, we, um, and by doing all of those things, we've managed to speak to 38 personnel in 12 library services, including some of your community partners. And we got 114 responses to the survey sent to all library services in England. And that's a 75% response rate, which we thought was really excellent. So um, before I go into the presentation, it's just me today because my colleague Wendy is away, but we both wanted to say thank you so much to all those of you who are on the call today who've uh, contributed to the research or helped connect us to, to people um, so that we could have that rich range of, um, of input. So I'm going to start by talking about the framework that's already been mentioned. Um, uh, you can see it on the slide there. It's in, I think it's in the, um, the various sort of downloadable resources that have gone up online uh, today. So you can look at it at your leisure. But that was, our, that was our starting point to develop that in a very collaborative way, as I've said. And what that framework did was it gave us a structure to carry out the research and to describe and analyze the role of libraries in um, digital inclusion. And in a moment, I'll just quickly walk us through it just so that we all feel a bit familiar with it. But we did um, we did just wanna say quickly what, what, what this framework is and what it is not. Um, it aims to be a simple non-prescriptive tool um, that we hope will support libraries in their strategic thinking about their role, about advocacy for that role in closing the digital divide. It is not meant to be there as a sort of one size fits all prescription for what all library services and branches should um, be doing. However, it does aim to be a bit aspirational, to put forward some ideas and things that people might be doing um, as new or in addition to what they're already doing. Um, but again, not, um, but doing that without imposing expectations because um, we recognize and certainly comes through from the research, there's a real broad range of um, what's going to be appropriate to different the different kind of local contexts in which each um, library service and branch is operating. So just to quickly walk us through the framework, a lot of this will be extremely familiar to you, um, but what really struck us was the importance of the two cross-cutting themes around local ecosystem and equity, diversity and inclusion. So across the top, you can see libraries are part of an ecosystem of organizations, groups and networks that are working together on digital inclusion. And then in the middle, um, you can see your digital inclusion support offer, skills, connectivity devices, very familiar. We've added empowerment and I'll say a little bit about that um, shortly. And then across the bottom, equity, diversity and inclusion. It came across so strongly and it really echoes some of the points that um, Emma made when she was just sharing those sort of few um, statistics um, that are so current. Libraries are working with the public, including really very vulnerable groups and connecting them with vital public and other services, uh, many of which are increasingly moving online. 
So that's just a quick canter through the framework, just so we're all um, a little bit familiar with it. And I'll now um, say a little bit about the findings in connection with each element, starting with the local ecosystem. Is it okay to go on to the next slide, Lou? Thank you. So the, excuse me, <laughs> one of the things that people said was the library is itself a community asset that can assist organisations in the public and voluntary sectors to come together and work across the digital divide, whether that's literally convening them to meet and organise and discuss, or <laughs> I want to apologise, um, or to, to, to collaborate in other ways, but they're either on the high street or they're somewhere central that makes that role um, very appropriate. And it's by bringing people together in this way that libraries are a part of that wider ecosystem that can help find solutions and narrow the um, digital divide. Oh, sorry, it's very badly timed cough. Um, other points that were made um, about this, um, people talked about the uh, the real value of having library personnel in development and delivery roles. So both kind of holding strategic responsibilities and also more sort of frontline responsibilities who are really well connected into the communities. Again, that really helps to take the message out that you're there to um, get involved in closing the digital divide and, and, and to work with um, others. Clearly capacity for partnership working varies hugely um, and so does the intensity of the partnerships. And one of the things we wanted to emphasize again is that there is no value attached to whether what you have are some very formal long-term, maybe even contractual partnerships or whether you have kind of great friends and acquaintances in your um, local community sector who you um, cooperate with to um, extend your reach. All of those things are of value. And just to um, draw your attention to one, the final bullet point on that slide, so, um, one or two people said to us, well, community projects come and go, but the library stays. Community projects you know, often have very short term funding. It's a bit precarious. And so the library is that kind of stable presence in their lives, if you like. And um, sometimes that might mean joining up in joint bids and applications. And other times it just might mean being a sort of stable presence and support for that community project. That's, I think, oh, I suppose the only other thing to say, oh, it's fine to sound that stay on that slide, Lou. And um, the only other thing to say, I suppose, is that um, when we ask people about the range of partnerships they have, and the partnerships with the voluntary and community sector, faith-based organisations, all of those kinds of bodies was the kind of the biggest volume. Um, but relationships with local authorities, especially around, say, health and um, education, employment, those kinds of issues um, was also very um, significant. So the next part of the um, framework is around skills and employment um, empowerment. And we put those two things together because... Uh, when we were looking through what we were getting back, it felt like the gaining of skills had a massive impact on people's confidence and self-esteem, but also their sense of agency over their lives when um, life um, was very difficult for them. And the first bullet point there, a range of offers that are flexible, adaptable and informal helps libraries to reach and meet a range of needs and interests. So that kind of flexibility and willing to be adaptable, willing to be kind of warm and informal was a lot of what of what made um, reach into uh, digitally excluded communities um, particularly effective, people told us. Um, and one of the things that was quite interesting was one of the things people talked about was how telling positive stories about what other people have gained from learning digital skills was really great in promoting it and engaging people and drawing people into this. And the most persuasive stories were around mental health and well-being, contact with friends and loved ones, and then dispelling um, fears and myths around the, the, the online world. So you can see a few statistics on the screen there. I won't go through all of them and Emma's mentioned some already. Um, but again, just thinking about the, uh, the skills, um, people said often people are coming in to acquire skills through necessity. They need to access a service um, that's no longer available to them in person, for example. Um, but that although that was through necessity and often really frustrating and maybe stressful and worrying, 
it still seemed to be acting as a springboard into uh, wider learning and, and seeing that there are wider benefits of gaining uh, digital skills that some of which might lead into um, sort of pleasurable activities or um, hobbies or more contact with loved ones. Um, a couple of factors just to mention, these won't surprise you. Um, the distinction between the kinds of digital skill support that are going to be offered by larger or main library branches as compared to smaller ones. Again, there's no kind of value attached to that. The smaller ones might find it more appropriate to be doing kind of quite ad hoc informal work and the larger ones maybe sort of more comprehensive offers like courses and programs, maybe some accreditation. It's a little bit different. Um, and of course, the other factor is all of this has to be underpinned by suitable IT um, infrastructure and um, staff time. So I will, yeah, and you can just see there, uh, for, sorry, a few examples on that about um, skills to be able to get blue badges, doctor's appointments, people talked about bus passes, those kinds of things. So next, moving on to data connectivity. Um, so libraries are, you know, it came through really strongly that libraries are working with vulnerable groups um, to offer them connectivity to access public, essential public services and then other things that may help them in their lives, um, many of which are increasingly moving um, online. Um, nine in ten library services are offering free use of library computers with the latest browser, which is fantastic. And as um, and um, some of them are offering things like free mobile data. And as Emma said, um, many more would like to be able to develop um, that service. And where it does exist, it's popular and in um, high, high demand. Um, one thing to sort of mention in terms of development of this service, something that was coming up for a lot of libraries was Wi-Fi printing. Um, this was partly a kind of point of convenience that people might not have a printer at home, which might be to do with poverty, but it was also sometimes, again, connected back to these essential services. And the example, one example I remember being given was um, a family needing to sort out school applications. And for whatever reason, even though um, everything was available online, the, the, the form itself had to be um, printed. Um, so, yeah, so Wi-Fi printing seems to be quite a live thing that a lot of services want to be able to introduce. And just to draw attention to an example here, and I will have to defer to somebody else if you, if people want more detail, because my text knowledge is not up to it. But um, people gave um, said that said it was really great that there was a way uh, to create a mesh network that meant that you could set up a local area network that provides free access to the internet within areas of high deprivation. So I think what we took it took from that was you know you could spot pockets of really high deprivation where there's going to be a lot of people not online and uh, do something about that. Maybe uh, that might be a kind of something to talk to housing associations about potentially. OK, so the next bit of the framework is around devices. Um, so again, really high um, numbers, um, high proportions of library services, just doing that kind of real kind of core cool stuff about providing charging points for devices. 95% um, providing desktops and laptops, that, that kind of stuff. Um, and then some libraries, again, a similar picture to the one Emma alluded to earlier. Some of them are already uh, running um, schemes where they can lend a device or they can make uh, uh, provide um, a device, get, give, give people devices. Um, and many, many more would um, would like to, to, to do that. Um, we it, what struck us when we looked at devices was there was a really high degree of innovation around this, but there were also some some some, some difficulties, um, and they're similar to the point I made about uh, sort of community projects. A lot of it is project based funding, which is essentially time limited, um, and often it seemed to be quite dependent on staff goodwill and enthusiasm to make it work, which is of course brilliant <laughs> that you've got that staff goodwill and enthusiasm, but it potentially means that those schemes are a little bit precarious and um, maybe haven't quite moved into something uh, where they can uh, seem 
uh, sustainable and, and part of a sort of longer term solution. And of course, they already also need um, substantial investment. I will think I'll skip over that slide, Lou, and go on now to talk about equity, diversity and inclusion, which you'll remember was the, the cross cutting theme at the uh, at the bottom of the um, framework. So it came, one of the things that came through really strongly from all the way through the research was that the role of the library or library service within the ecosystem is absolutely linked to equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, libraries are working with those kind of community groups that are in touch with people and making a, such a valuable contribution to supporting different community groups, um, digital inclusion and uh, making it possible for different communities to 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 access this um so one of the reasons for this was a was 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 something that of course you're all familiar with this this point that libraries are a universal service they're free they're open they're accessible to all um something that people really drew out was that staff often reflect that community and that makes them as a kind of uh, makes the place more sort of relatable, feel more accessible, feel more um, welcoming. Um, so it was really, really positive picture. But a lot of people also did say to us, there are still communities that we know aren't using our libraries, aren't taking up our services, our services. So loads of fantastic um, examples. Um, a Ukraine drop in session, a deaf digital inclusion group. Um, an open to all drop in digital inclusion session run by a Filipino women's group um, a community librarian who was working with a member of a, a, a refugee community that was in the city who was just interested in understanding more about the library's offer and then willing and interested to find ways to then cascade that out to other um, parts of their community. So lots of fantastic examples. And we were really struck by the contribution. And um, I know there's, uh, I may use the slightly wrong word, but libraries as sanctuary, a, a really, really big thread running through all of this about being uh, welcoming to people seeking asylum and refugees. Um, so, yeah, so, um, and just to give one other example, just to round it out a little bit, so yes, that real kind of warm offer to um, people seeking asylum, but also some really interesting examples of um, uh, equity and diversity and inclusion through, say, co-locating um, staff. So one um, organisation gave an example of having um, adult social care staff based in libraries as a different way to, um, to be in touch with them. So I've now been through each of the five parts of the framework um, and I want to finish by saying something about how we can bring that all together and then something about how we talk about it, the, the advocacy piece that Emma mentioned um, at the beginning. So the, there is the, the, the evidence, all of the evidence that I've just described really points to the value of having a local digital inclusion strategy. And that is something that we found many library services lacked, um, either themselves um, or the, the particularly that they, or that there wasn't one within the local authority that they could kind of attach themselves to. Um, but what, just to talk about library services, what people said was great if there is a digital inclusion strategy, is it gives that work legitimacy, it means the leadership's on board, um, and without it, it can feel a bit like pushing an elephant up the hill is, is the phrase that somebody used to us. And I think what they meant by that was, you're always having to kind of justify it, um, so it doesn't have that legitimacy. The research also highlighted the critical importance of partnership working within the local ecosystem, and of ensuring that equity, diversity, and inclusion underpins this work. So we were kind of thinking, well, how does that all come together and we thought that one way of bringing it all together strategy ecosystem equity diversity and inclusion is to borrow from the idea of place-based approaches to change and I'm um, I apologize for using a bit of jargon that some people will be familiar with maybe others not um 
But the idea when people talk about a place-based approach and what they're talking about is deliberate, is, is that those approaches deliberately concentrate on building connections and taking action in order that people experience a better quality of life. Um, so that's just a thought to leave you with as one kind of way of framing things. So we hope that the research findings and outputs will be useful to you. We are excited to see how libraries connected and good things kind of take them forward. Um, in the long report, you will find detail of your survey findings. Some of that may be helpful when you're making the case yourselves. You'll find the framework um, and you'll find practice notes. So each of those elements of the framework that I've just talked about, there is a practice note that, that, that draws out some of the different ways um, that people are putting that into action, some of the challenges they've experienced and so on. So there's a lot more detail, um, which I hope people will find useful. So final slide, um, I'm going to end with five framings that we pulled out of the research and, and that may be helpful when talking about the library services offer. So that, that adv advocacy piece that um, Emma mentioned at the beginning, and I'll just go through them and end there. So the first one is positive. A lot of good stuff is already happening. So talk about it, this is happening. Library services have got the skills, they've got the infrastructure. Um, yes, there's a message that needs to come up behind about the need for resources to do it more, better and more sustainably. But there is a really positive message there about the role that library services are already taking. Place-based and collaborative. Um, the being willing and able to work in partnership with others was really critical to library services, unlocking ways that they can be a part of closing the digital divide in their in their areas um, and the other bit to say about that which as you didn't mention earlier is um library services are great boundary spanners we we thought and um, they're great at working across local authorities sometimes with departments that don't speak to one another but they all speak to the library service we spoke to people from library services who sit in meetings and kind of go oh well, I know that so-and-so in that team is, is, is doing something about that as well. So they're, they're brilliant boundary spanners within local authorities and between um, and within the voluntary sector and between the two. Universal, free and open. Of course, that's all language that's super familiar to you. Um, but in, in the context of this research, participants really wanted to build on that kind of really important message. Um, and it was about in this context, it was about all the different kinds of things people might be wanting to do or know or find out about and about showing that the offer is not just in the library, but also available online and in the community. And there's a, just a really nice quote from one person saying the library service doesn't judge and we just work with ordinary people. And that leads on to trusted and safe. And this felt very, very important and very valuable to um, your role. Um, so a lot of the uh, contributed ideas around this building a kind of narrative and framings um, talked about libraries, libraries themselves, individual libraries being places that people trust and see as places of safety where they're treated with respect and um, are not stigmatised. And I'll just say exactly what people said to us. This means people may feel more inclined to seek help in library branches because they don't expect to be made to feel stupid or judged for applying for and or finding it difficult to navigate information or welfare applications online. And we thought that was really crucial. And the final one, lifelong learning. People said libraries have always been places of learning where people can come to ask questions and get answers. And they felt that digital inclusion in some, in many ways is, is no different. Um, and, and like their community partners, Libraries are really good at finding the hooks, finding reasons why people might be willing and interested to engage with digital uh, that aren't to do with accredited learning. Not that that doesn't have a place, but are really about lifelong learning, about, about really showing people how they can live their life online and have some agency in that. So thank you for listening. I'm uh, here for questions um, if you have them ahead of your workshops. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lila. And, um, 
And I do encourage all of you to think about what questions you want to ask Lila, because in about five minutes, Dave Lloyd is going to be kind of taking us through um, a questions and answer session. So uh, if you want to type some questions in the chat or if you want to get ready to raise your hand and contribute, please do so. But meanwhile, I am delighted to hand over to Luke Burton from Arts Council England. Um, and it was Arts Council England's generous grant that enabled Libraries Connected and Good Things Foundation to do this research together. Um, that also is what meant that we needed to limit the, um, the scope of the research participation to England. But I know that there are people in this room who are from outside England, which is brilliant because we really hope some of these findings will resonate in other parts of the UK as well. Luke, handing over to you now. Thanks, Emma. And it's great to see such a good turnout for, for the, the report. It's uh, timely and obviously of value. Um, yeah, as Emma says, I'm Luke Burton. I'm the Director for Libraries Arts Council England. Um, until recently, I was Head of Service in Newcastle. So I've, uh, I've been switching my head from how I would have been using this as a Head of Service to sort of how this uh, impacts on what Arts Council England are doing. Um, I think it's, you know, in, in the short in simple terms, it's important to have this type of quality research um, as an evidence base or to add to the evidence base for what libraries and their partners can do. Um, it kind of tackles the, you would say that argument, you know, that we, we, we know what's happening within the sector. We know the value of the work that, that many of you are doing, but it's, it's having this independent research that comes from outside the sector that helps add weight and, and evidence to, to, to the work that you're carrying out. Um, I keep saying from a selfish point of view, I don't mean, from, from my point of view, it helps in terms of advocacy internally at Arts Council England towards our creative health teams and others, um, and also uh, how we can work into central government on that. Um, Arts Council England obviously is an organisation has the sector development responsibility around libraries, but it's not always a natural partner for people to come towards because of it, it, it's seen as focusing on creative. But again, this is about how Arts Council can advocate internally and externally for the role that libraries have around supporting digital inclusion and digital access. Um, I think a couple of the key points for me, as Emma had said, that, that came, jumped out of the report for me was that um, part of a wider ecosystem. So libraries not always being the only answer, but certainly part of the answer and forming those partnerships within communities. And sometimes that partnership as well is within your local authorities or with your uh, commissioning bodies. You know that sometimes libraries have seen uh, a little bit on the edge was a little bit separate and it's a, a tool to hook back into those those other parts of the council and hopefully speak some of the language around skill support and upskilling. Um, I think that positive trusted and universal and free element uh, speaks really to the unique position that libraries hold within communities. Um, they reach communities that other institutions don't reach. They have a much lower barrier to access than health settings have or business support settings and certainly it's one of the key arguments that, that I'm making internally here at Arts Council that libraries reach those seldom heard communities that many other places and certainly many cultural organisations would, um, would bite hand off to get access to. So this isn't about being cynical about that, it's simply saying that, the, that you have these, bond, these connections with your communities and sit at the heart of your communities and have built those partnerships with organisations like Good Things and others to provide those services. Um, I think it's also the, the the, the appetite for innovation and, and, and to, to evolve and keep adapting is really uh, is, is really heartening to see. Um, and I suppose it speaks certainly to um, a lot of the, the investment principles that we have here at Arts Council. So, you know, we're, we're often looking to see how do organisations support the principles around dynamism or supporting ambition and quality or inclusive, inclusivity, easier, to, not that easy to say, inclusivity and relevance. Um, so it speaks to some of those key um, investment principles that we have as an organisation and again, allows me to make the case internally for the role that libraries can play, but also can hopefully be useful to you as organisations if you're looking to attract um, additional funding. So I think, you know, Arts Council at the moment is doing work to reposition itself about being a development agency that um, awards grants. So, you know, the develop development role we have is key and, and I'm happy to talk to anyone who's got questions or comments or ideas about how uh, we can support our sector development, but also in acknowledging that we do, we are a source of grant funding and also acknowledging that grant funding isn't a replacement for your core revenue funding. And I know that you are still all facing challenges around um, long-term funding and local government settlements. But hopefully um, research like this will allow you to speak to um, things like National Lottery Project grants. So just to make you aware that um, libraries 
can apply for um, activity that addresses the universal library offers. So not only those activities that address cultural and creative activity, but they um, also address things like digital inclusion and health and wellbeing. So um, we are looking to try and encourage more application project grant applications. Um, those applications can be under 30,000 or, or nationally significant ones over 100,000. But say if people are interested in looking at um, digital inclusion work, you can apply for National Lottery Project grant, grant funding to do that in England. The applicant has to be a library, but you can partner again, building those, those local partnerships to deliver with other organisations. Um, but if people do want more information on, on project grants, I'm happy to share any of that afterwards. But I would encourage people, we don't see many project grants from libraries or haven't recently. So um, I think those that are well written and those that are in priority places, uh, the Arts Council's priority places, um, would, would be looked on favourably. Also continued capital funding as well. So the Libraries Improvement Fund funding is uh, this round is coming to an end shortly. Um, the expressions of interest close next week. But uh, I think it's again keeping an eye out for any other uh, grant applications or projects that may be the fit in this realm. I, I know some people in, in the virtual room, I suppose, will be in the seat of the library on grants through British Library as well. So it's looking for those. And two final things I would say is one, it speaks to some work we're doing around accreditation, um, which is looking at how libraries can support the communities they serve. And again, I think digital inclusion is key to that. And also just point you to the digital inclusion network, uh, the digital culture network to Arts Council England for support around uh, activities around uh, improving digital services. But yeah, in summary, I'd say, you know, it's a really, uh, I think it's a really valuable and useful piece of research and look forward to. And I, I suppose one last thing I would say is if anyone uses this, I suppose, in anger, if you like, if, if you can demonstrate how this has given impact, then I'd be really interested to hear because it's really helpful to make that case. Those case studies of how it's been used are really powerful. But thanks for your time and I hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Um, thank you very much, Luke. And I'd just like to echo about the National Lottery Project Grants. Being the recipient of one, uh, they were extremely useful. Um, and if people want to hold off about putting one on until I get my next one in, that's equally fine. But um, yeah, please have a look at it and discuss it with your um, Arts Council uh, representatives. Um, if the question and answer session, I've got one question so far in the chat. So if anyone would like to add some further questions or to put their hand up, that would be ideal. Uh, but the one question that we have in chat at the moment is, do libraries have the resources needed by some people for one-to-one -one support? I don't know who wants to pick that one up. Lila, are you wanting to come in with any insights from the research around that? Shall I say a couple of things and then hand in to other people from... Um, so in terms of the research, the question is... So I'll, I'll, I'll go back a step and then leave others to comment on the resourcing. So um, is there a need to give one-to-one -one support? Yes, absolutely. And uh, for some people, um, it, may, it requires one-to-one -one support repeating the same stuff over a period of time until they've developed the confidence and the and, and retention to be able to use those things confidently and independently so it does take time and um, it can it requires um capacity training and enthusiasm of staff and is made more of a challenge with the loss of, of volunteers that a lot of um library services experienced during covid uh, which is problematic some of you said you're building that back up but others others not um but i suppose the um the comment i'd make is the some of the some of the people we spoke to had really thought a lot about their role in the local ecosystem were really at great pains to say you know we're not here to do everything we but we have often become um the public face of a lot of other stuff so we need to keep remembering to triage people elsewhere to develop our partnerships so we so so that we can find ways to um signpost people to where they can get some support but maybe i can hand on to somebody else to comment sort of directly answer that question i was maybe just wanting to pull something else out from the research which was that um i think in terms of the resources 
one of the key findings was about the variability of provision and that will link to the variability of resources available. Uh, and that's variation between different library services, but also within a library service as well as to um, what um, provision, uh, say a local branch is able to make available. Um, and that also then reflected, I think, as L Lila was talking earlier about, about the extent to which things were done either as structured programmes or that <coughs> facility to provide ad hoc support. Um, there was a, quite a lot of concern that came through about the challenges about recruiting volunteers and a sense that in some libraries um, it was becoming harder to find and retain volunteers and having volunteers who were upskilled and trained would be um, one of the ways in which uh, a, a branch or a service might be able to offer more of that personalised one-to-one -one support. Um, so, so I think there was a kind of a, a variety of experiences there, um, but a sense that um, it was both necessary for some people and not always easy to be able to resource that. Um, there, I can see there are a number of questions coming through, Dave, though, so I wonder if you want to kind of respond to some of the questions. I'll quickly come in on the one about the, is there a non-print format available for this? So we have... Please, Dave. PDF versions available at the moment. That's a really interesting question. There is an HTML version of the summary document, but not an HTML version of the full document. Um, and, and so it would be good to know if this is something that others would value. Um, and, and that might be something that Libraries Connected Good Things Foundation and Arts Council England might need to go away um, and consider whether or not we can you know, get the resource together in order to make that um, that available. So that's a really helpful comment. And maybe if others can comment as to whether they'd find that useful too, that would be uh, really helpful to know. Back to you, Dave. Okay, so we've answered that question. Um, great to see health and wellbeing in the framework. In work we are doing on health and digital literacy, it is of, often confidence of public library staff that is an issue. Was this part of the study? So, um, again, happy for other people from the uh, the panel, as it were, to, to comment. But um, so library staff, confidence, goodwill and enthusiasm was a massive enabling factor across pretty much everything I've just talked about. Um, and where but but the extent of that confidence and the actual skills did um, did did certainly vary at the level of individual staff members. One of the things that was kind of helpful was the role of digital champion, where um, they were in a position within their team to kind of cascade um, things that the, uh, the, the 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 sort of that library staff were hearing and seeing up to others and 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 vice versa to kind of draw down um, resources um, opportunities and ideas from from the library service so that that did vary quite a lot in how that was performed but that but but where it where it was working in that way that was that was really beneficial but there there there, there yes um, the answer is um it wasn't the kind of primary focus but it did come up and certainly the skills and confidence of staff varied a lot and it is a clear key factor um, in the um, in the delivery of all of this. I suppose the kind of flip side of it was that we heard lots of stuff about um, the kind of empathy and warmth of library staff. I've actually experienced that as a volunteer that works with the migrant community near where I live. I've gone into a library with somebody who didn't think that they'd be allowed to walk across the threshold and the warmth and empathy of the staff in that particular library made a massive difference to the whole experience while we were in that building. Um, so that's the kind of flip side <laughs> that you, um, that the, 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 the sort of, uh, the authenticity of your staff is really, really important, but there is, um, a lot of people said there is also a training need to try and kind of raise the overall minimum level of confidence and skills across all staff. Does anyone like to add anything? If not, the last digital survey that was done of public library staff probably echoed uh, those findings. Um, uh, very generally, staff seem to be very confident of dealing with inquiries and helping people individually, tutoring or providing 
computer learning sessions was um, something which I found far more uh, harder to undertake. Um, where will the report be presented after today? So it's on the Good Things Foundation website. I'm hoping, I don't know if James Gray is here, if it's going on to the Libraries Collected resources website. Uh, yes, it will. <laughs> I think it will, yeah. So hopefully there will be those two main locations where the uh, report will go. I'm sure it will be rep uh, presented to a number of partner organisations over the next few months, but I don't know if that's been quite uh, agreed and outlined, Emma or Lou. Um, so I think this is a great opportunity, actually. Um, for There's a couple of things. First, first of all, we'll be able to uh, share um, the edit down the presentation section uh, of today and so that that means that you know we can promote that through social media that can be available maybe on a link via libraries base camp so in terms of if there are people that you want to hear about um, the findings and you want to share the recording of the presentation then please do that um, also to um you know to an extent where there are kind of uh, larger events that you're aware of if you think that it would be helpful uh for you know someone from either libraries connected or good things foundation or wsa community consultants to be able to um provide a presentation then please do let us know um it's it's always great to be able to go where people already are um and similarly you know luke if uh, arts council england is kind of holding or convening other events where you think it would be helpful to share this in, then we're really um, open to being able to receive some of those um, opportunities. Um, and I think maybe the other thing to say is that now that we we and you, all of you in this virtual room, um, have, got, um, have got these findings, then that means there are opportunities for us to bring this into part of our presentations in other forums more generally you know this is now part of the evidence base we have about uh, the role of libraries as part of that ecosystem it's part of uh, our advocacy work more generally um so so it was a great question rosie and and that's how we're planning to use it um and yes uh also to to make um, people aware within DCMS, within uh, the new uh, Department of Science, Innovation and Technology, um, and also then uh, the, the other kind of key department that we identified was uh, the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities as well. Um, so um, if so, yes, we will do our best uh, to be able to um, get this out to key people. Okay, I'm conscious we've got about three minutes and questions are coming in. Um, reflecting on something that was shared earlier, considering the central role that libraries played locally in delivery of digital inclusion projects, I wondered if we could hear a little bit more about examples of the research where in local authority, a digital inclusion strategy has been led by the library service rather than the, I presume this is going to be rather than the wider council organisation. I think this sort of like poses a question for me about the report and about the need for libraries to learn about best practice from other services. It would be quite interesting when we look at this report in more detail about how we can share best practice from other library services. So maybe quite a difficult question to answer today, but I do understand the point that's made there. Um, was there any work to look at models in other devolved nations? Unless I'm... N no, wrong, so... I think no, yeah. Yeah, so no, there wasn't. But I think that's why, Steve, and I'm so glad you're here. And the reason that I invited you was partly to be able to say, we've now got this in respect to England. What are the opportunities to be able to share this and explore what might be similar or what might be different um, across the different nations and jurisdictions within the UK? So really happy to have a follow on conversation uh, with you, Libraries Connected and, and others uh, in Scotland and Wales uh, around that and Northern Ireland too. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, we'll try and make this the last one. We've got a minute left. 
Are there opportunities to join together the data in this study with other work or studies in progress? I am from the National NHS Libraries team, now part of NHS England, and we have joint work with SILIP Libraries Connected and ACE at the moment. So we'd be interested in exploring 100%. Yes, so Ruth, yes, we will try and make, yeah, but no, I think that's absolutely ideal. Um, is it best now, Lou, to go to the uh, workshops? And I will try and keep an eye on the questions to see if we can uh, put a few more in towards the end of the webinar. That sounds great. Thank you, Dave, and thanks to everyone for your questions. I'll just share my screen just to give a little bit of an explanation of what we're going to be doing now. So we are going to be going into five breakout rooms. We have um, been joined today by five brilliant, uh, in fact, six library services. We've got a bonus of two library services in one room, and we're going to really delve into some of the thematic areas um, that are mentioned in the framework. Uh, luckily, the ones that are presenting today were also libraries that participated in the research. And um, so they are library services that contributed to the interview stage of this research too. I think before, whilst they are thematic areas, it's also really important to know, as um, already mentioned, there is a lot of crossover. So, so when we're talking about connectivity, um, some of that will also dip into devices. When we're talking about skills, all of these things are really interconnected. So it, it, although we have split them into five different areas, there will be a lot of kind of crossover and talking about all areas of digital inclusion within those rooms too. So you will be able to choose the breakout room that you go into. And in a few moments, my colleague Kirsten will open those rooms up for you. And we will have one library service or more who will present their approach. We'll have time for questions and some discussion there too. And so if you've been to our meetups before, then this will have an opportunity for you to connect with other library services and to share a bit perhaps of your work in this area too. And um, as we are quite a big group today and there are five rooms, um, I'll ask people to, whilst you're in the breakout rooms, use the raise hand function to ask any questions or to make a contribution. And um, if you want to practice doing that now, you can do so by clicking on the reaction button uh, in the um, bottom bar. And I'll show you what it looks like now. If I always forget how to do this, so I appreciate a practice run. Um, great. So we will also do our best to record the first 10 minutes. So the presentation from library services and we'll record those so that we can share those with um, people who haven't been able to. Uh, or maybe wanted to hear about a couple of the different thematic areas and people that haven't been able to attend today's session. So we have here with us today, um, room one, we'll be talking about equity, diversity, inclusion and digital. And we have Greg from Leeds Libraries. Room two, we have um, Michelle Krauser from Rochdale Libraries talking about access to connectivity. Cambridgeshire and Warwickshire Libraries um, will be talking about devices and their approach to device loan schemes and gifting. Room four, we have uh, Jackie Usher from West Sussex Libraries talking about partnerships and local digital inclusion ecosystems. And finally, we have Emma from Norfolk Libraries who will be talking about their approach to supporting people to learn digital skills. And um, we'll open up those rooms now. And if you have any questions about the rooms before we go into, we'll do our best to make sure any technical things are answered before we go in. So, have the rooms been open? They should be. Can everybody see them? Thanks, Kirsten. I think as I'm host, sometimes it doesn't quite appear. No. Interesting. Um, they're open on my side. Do you think, um, does it help if you stop the screen sharing? Oh yeah, good plan. We should have five open um, and a couple of people assigned to them already. Oh yeah, I can see that they are open. Brill.
Oh, so we've, um, Alex says they have a message telling me that they're waiting to be assigned to a room. Um, they should be able to choose their own rooms um, from the way it's set up. Um, so can I just ask, how do we find the rooms? And if we can choose our own, how do we find them? I think we're just having a slight issue with this, getting them, uh, getting people into their rooms. But we will, we'll, what we'll do, should we close all the rooms and get them set up again? Yeah, we'll do that. Great, cool. Does it matter I join for a browser rather than not downloading Zoom? Because I can't see anything either. No, I think it's a general issue we're having. So all right, cool. there with those two minutes will be ready to go. So I had the privilege of being in the group around uh, connectivity and we were just having um, an excellent conversation. And I am sure in all of the different groups, there will have been excellent conversations going on um, as well. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to kind of share any key reflections that have come from their uh, different groups. Um, I don't know if um, maybe Lou or Luke or Anna, um, if there are any particular things that you want to uh, share that came through your groups. Um, I will just share that, yeah, it was great to hear from Emma at Norfolk Libraries about just the many different ways that you support people to learn digital skills. There's a lot of conversation about upskilling staff, um, both in digital skills and, and in feeling confident to support people to learn digital skills too. Um, it sounds like a few different services are thinking about that and thinking of ways to, from the application process and recruitment process onwards on how we can make sure librarians feel confident to do that. Brilliant. And Anna, any reflections from you? Uh, yeah, no, I, very lively discussion. People had lots of questions, which was great to see. We, we got into the, the nitty gritty of how a device ski, uh, lending scheme works in practice, which is exactly what we were hoping people would get out of the session. So, you know, what kind of software do you install to keep the devices secure? How, how does it work in practice, working with IT departments or not working with IT departments? So yeah, just, just a lot of very detailed practical questions. I don't know if um, Angie or Rosie or Luke want to add anything. Um, yeah, just to say I've um, I've popped it in the chat, but I'm going to be at the SILIP conference in July. So if anybody wants to meet up for a, have a have a mini meeting over coffee about um, anything that I've talked about or any anything to do with the project, um, just drop me a an email and we can do that. Brilliant, Rosie. Sorry, unmuting myself. No, it was, it was really good because obviously there's a huge contrast between Angie's Warwickshire and what we do in Cambridgeshire because ours is very late touch and Angie, bless her heart, has, has had hurdles. And it's, it's really interesting that, you know, people can see the different approaches depending on your circumstances. And I think that that whole thing about learning from the hurdles and each other's pain points and getting into the detail uh, is just as important as hearing from um, the inspiring examples of, you know, people have taken things forward. Like we were hearing from um, Michelle in Rochdale about the mesh network, which is still an innovation that feels, you know, um, really quite unique. Um, so it was just fascinating hearing about that. Luke, any reflections from you? Uh, just to add that it was, you know, on devices, it's great to see that uh, two very different approaches uh, achieving the same outcome. So, brilliant, and and I think part of part of what we're surfacing here really does link to the value of being able to have that peer support. So, whilst the frame the framework document, if you have a look at the framework report and the practice notes, it includes a lot of examples from the experience of the 12 different library services uh, that took part in the qualitative research, which was really about trying to understand, uh, you know, the learnings and the experiences of different uh, library services. 
Um, but, uh, but absolutely, there is still this kind of real importance of being able to meet up and swap stories and share best practice. Um, and Lou has uh, kind of highlighted here uh, the fact that, um, you know, one of the things you can do is join the next meetup, the libraries meetup group that Good Things Foundation mm -hmm. coordinates with Luke and Anna and Angie and Rosie, and the next one being on the 21st of September. Um, we would also love for you uh, to take part in the network survey, Good Things Foundation's network survey. If you haven't already, please, please, please just do that if you're a member of the National Digital Inclusion Network. Um, and also um, just to flag that as well as the important opportunities, the bigger funding opportunities that Luke Burton mentioned earlier about the project grants, uh, the National Lottery's project grants, there is a smaller but still we hope really valuable funding opportunity that Good Things Foundation is putting out to all members of uh, the network and those are for digital inclusion capability grants so that's open at the moment it closes on the 23rd of June and um, up to £5,000 is available uh, to network members to apply for and that's around um, building your own digital confidence and capabilities as an organisation and I think that really speaks to some of the issues and concerns that have been raised here about turnover of staff, around trying to find new volunteers, about needing then to upskill volunteers, even in things that libraries might have been using for a long time, like Learn My Way. And of course, there is a new look, Learn My Way, out now as well. So, um, so please do uh, find out more about those opportunities and apply if you think uh, those are relevant to you. Um, we're also really encouraging you to help to spread the word and going back to the conversation that we had earlier, Jess Flack posted uh, in the chat about is there a social media toolkit? Well, we've done social media for the launch today, but I think that's a really good point about whether or not there is kind of ongoing social media uh, support that we can uh, provide and a toolkit that we can develop um, in relation to this piece of work and advocating from it more broadly. And that's something that um, we can roll into the conversation around whether we can make uh, more of it available through a kind of a web-based approach as well. 